Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you're zooming in from. Um, happy Lunar New Year. I'm excited to be here today to be your host for today's installment of the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Megan Wong. I'm a lecturer in law at the School of Law here at the University of Essex, where I'm the postgraduate director of the LLM degree in international law. Before I introduce our chair for today, Dr. Emily Jones and our speaker, Dr. Dina Subala, let me introduce the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. And for those of you who are joining us again, it is really good to have you back. So the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series is very much founded on friendship between Dr. Jones and I and our mutual respect for each other's scholarships and approaches to public international law. Although Dr. Jones and I are both generalist public international lawyers, our approaches differ as I'm a formalist and she's a critical legal scholar. Yet we take pride in our own and each other's approaches to international law and have celebrated this by putting together this series which combines both important intellectual traditions of public international law formalism and international legal practice and international legal theory. Our lecture series was inaugurated by Professor Niels Blocker from the University of Leiden on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the first UN Sec um, Security Council resolution adopted in January this year, followed by a lecture by Professor Lauri Malkso from the University of Tartu last week. For the rest of the spring term, our speakers are Colombian diplomat and head of treaty section, Lucia Solano, Professor Marty Koskinyemi, His Excellency Judge Kransat Kiti Chaisari, Professor Hilary Charlesworth, and Professor Campbell McLaughlin. Um, so please join us for our future sessions as well. Um, but now I'm delighted to host our first international legal theory session and we'll now introduce our chair for today's lecture who will then introduce our speaker, Dr. Zuvala. So Dr. Emily Jones is a lecturer in law at the University of Essex. She's a generalist public international lawyer specializing in gender and international law, science and technology, and international law and international environmental law. Today's lecture falls very much within the expertise of Dr. Jones, who draws widely on both Twale and Marxist scholarship in her own research, often drawing links between these perspectives and feminist and queer approaches and analysis of international law. Dr. Jones has recently published a co-authored book with Zed entitled The Law of War and Peace, A General Analysis, Volume 1, and her monograph, Feminist Theory and International Law, Post-Human Perspectives, is forthcoming with Routledge's Glass House series, so something to look forward to. Um, and now, Dr. Jones, I will hand over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Um, a great introduction to the series, um, just to give everybody a bit of a sense of what we are trying to do with this series. Um, so, as Dr. Wong noted, this is our third event, but I'm very, very excited today to have Dr. Dina Zuvala with us um, speaking about her new book. Um, it's a really excellent book, which you should definitely read, get your library to order, etc. So I am going to give you a brief introduction um, to Dina before giving you a few brief housekeeping rules. So Dina joined the Australian National University College of Law, which is in Canberra, Australia, as a senior lecturer in July 2020. Prior to this appointment, she was an Australian Research Council Laureate Postdoctoral Fellow at Melbourne Law School. And she obtained her PhD from Durham Law School, which is obviously in the UK, in 2016, where she was also a lecturer. Dina's work focuses on the political, political economy, history and theory of international law, and she is especially interested in historical materialism, deconstruction, feminist and queer legal theory. Her first monograph, Capitalism as Civilization, a History of International Law, which is what she's going to be talking about today, was published by Cambridge University Press uh, just last year in 2020. Dina is a member of the editorial collective of the Third World Approaches to International Law Review, um, another great review that you should check out after the series if you don't know about it. 
Um, and in early 2022, she was appointed as a senior advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. So that's Dina, but if you, if you don't know her already, definitely go check out her book. I'm sure today is going to persuade you. Uh, but it's, as I said, it's a really fantastic book. Um, but a few quick notes on housekeeping as well. Um, we will do questions um, through the Q&A function on Zoom. So you can post your questions at any point during, um, during the lecture, but I will be asking Dina these questions at the end. Um, we tend to get quite a few questions, so I'll do my best to get through as many as we can, but that's just a, a kind of disclaimer for myself there, really. Um, but if you do want me to read your name out, then please just post as yourself. Your name will come up on Zoom. But if you want to remain anonymous, then you click the anonymous button and then you will be anonymous and I won't know who you are. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's it from me. Um, I'm really proud to present Dr. Dina Duvala, who's going to be presenting on capitalism as civilization. Over to you. Thank you. And yeah, before I get started, I want to thank uh, Dr. Jones and Dr. Wong for putting together this fantastic series. And of course, uh, for having me here to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, and also, yeah, as um, Emily said, I am currently finding myself in Canberra. And I want to acknowledge that long before this place was known as Canberra, it has been um, the country of the Nagal girl people. And I want to uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I want to also acknowledge that sovereignty over these lands has never been lawfully ceded. Um, and that I myself find myself here without proper invitation. So, um, and that in, a, in many senses relates uh, to the things I want to talk to, uh, to you um, today. And um, as Emily said, I'm, I'm, I wanted to basically present the, the basics um, of my book that came out last November, Capitalism and Civilization, A History of International Law. So, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. When we discuss civilization um, in international law, the idea is that this has been, or this was um, a tripartite hierarchy uh, between so-called semi, uh, civilized, semi-civilized and uncivilized states. So the idea was that this was not just a differentiation, it was very clearly a hierarchy, and at the top of this hierarchy, we could find civilized states that enjoyed basically the full range of rights and duties under international law. And as you can imagine, these were initially the European states, the United States of America, um, and the white dominions, basically. So Australia, New Zealand, to an extent, South Africa. Um, to an extent, of course, it was um, ruled by the white minority. In the middle, we found the so-called semi-civilized states, so which were primarily East Asian empires, such as Japan, China, Siam, which is, of course, now Thailand, Persia, the Ottoman Empire. And the idea is that semi-civilized states enjoyed a certain degree of rights and duties under international law, but not the full extent. So for example, they were, um, um, they were capable of signing legally binding treaties, but these legally binding treaties usually were the so-called unequal treaties that by definition uh, incorporated unequal rights and duties under international law. And at the bottom of this purported hierarchy, we found the so-called uncivilized states that predominantly um, uh, included uh, political communities in Africa, but also indigenous communities or, uh, around the world. And basically the idea was that these communities enjoyed the rights of humanity. So at least in theory, you couldn't mistreat them or you couldn't kill them uh, with total impunity, but they did not um, enjoy any political rights in international law. And the standard narrative um, in international legal history being self-understood international legal history or lay legal history, you know, in the first three pages of your PAL textbook is that basically this is an important but parochial concept that basically since 1945 and the UN Charter has become basically defined in international law. The argument is the UN Charter recognized the equal, the equal sovereignty of states. Um, 
and it made basically this tripartite hierarchy redundant. And of course, you can already see there are some cracks in these narratives, notably, not in this narrative, notably, of course, the ICDA statue. If you open the ICDA statute and you go to Article 38 to read the sources, you will see that the third um, source of international law is the general principles of law uh, as recognized by civilized states. And my experience have be, has been, and I think that's the experience of many, that usually, you know, this beat. Um, of uh, Article 38 is kind of waved away. We are told, oh, you know, now after 1945, by civilized states, we mean all states. This doesn't mean anything. This doesn't have any meaning. As you can imagine, critical um, theories of international law and especially third world um, approaches to international law theories are quite um, skeptical about um, this idea. And perhaps the most known and influential counter thesis to the mainstream is that articulated by Tony Angi in his pathbreaking imperialism, sovereignty, and the making of international law, where Tony Angi argued that civilization is, has been, I mean, it's still an important concept because it is but one expression of the ever-present dynamics of difference in international law. And I agree um, with Angie's um, account um, in many respects, but I also do feel a certain need to qualify or to clarify or to granulize a bit what it means to talk about these dynamics of difference. And the, the conclusion I arrived at um, in this book was the following. So my first conclusion is, it is worth thinking about civilization not as a unitary concept, one that lends itself to conclusive definition, but as a style or as a form of arguing about the distribution of rights and duties in international law. And that is important, I think, for a number of reasons. I'm happy to explain why I think this is a good idea. Um, but I think it's also important for a number of reasons, which is, I think it gives us a way to think beyond the real fact that is the decline of explicit usages of the word. So basically, if this is indeed a style or a form of arguing, the fact that international lawyers use the word civilized less is interesting, but it's not definitive. Like, because the, the style of argument might, and I think I am arguing that it has survived the demise of the explicit usages of the term. This raises the next question, which is if this is a style of arguing, what style of arguing is it? What does it, what does it entail? What does it make it particular and concrete? And my argument here is that as a style of arguing, civilization is both bifurcated and internally unstable. Let me explain what I mean by bifurcated. By bifurcated, I mean that the concept is basically a concept that has two different poles or two different logics. On the one hand, what I to what I call the logic of improvement, promises upon non-Western political communi communities, excuse me, equal inclusion, conditional upon them embracing basically capitalist modernity. So things like private law, state centralization, bureaucratization of the state, legalization of social domestic, but also of international affairs and so on and so forth. At the same, so that's the one pole, that's the thing that pulls in one direction. But there is another logic and it pulls towards the opposite direction. And that is what I coin the logic of biology. So basically a way of arguing that constantly defers this promise of equal inclusion based on ideas of immutable difference. And these ideas of immutable difference might take um, the form of racializing non-Western states and non-Western people, might take the form of infantilizing them. So the idea that, you know, these states are children and they need to be guided towards maturity, but they are not there yet, 
or they might assume the form of either feminization, so these states as being weak, the way supposedly women are, or hypermasculinization, so that they are overly aggressive, that they are governed by base instincts. And again, we cannot trust them with full rights and duties under international law. So that's the bifurcation. But what is the instability? And that is basically, in a sense, the Deridian part of the argument, the argument that says the deconstructive part of the argument, the argument that says, if you scratch a bit below the surface, what appears to be capitalist modernity turns out to be actually the culturally specific manifestations of political power in Western Europe. So in chapter five, I deal, for example, with the island of Palmas, and one of the things Huber, the arbitrator, said in the, or one of the criteria Huber used to determine who had sovereignty over the island of Palmas was who had planted a flag and, you know, a coat of arms. This is not at a certain level very deep capitalist modernity, this is just the way people in Western Europe came to symbolize perhaps capitalist modernity, uh, but that's about it. And the thing works vice versa. So what appears to be a logic of biology, what appears to be about race, if you scratch a bit below the surface, actually turns out to be about capitalist modernity. And a very typical example I think here would be racialized transatlantic chattel slavery that of course looks like and it is about race, but it was profoundly generative of capitalist development around the Atlantic. So basically, international lawyers in the 19th century were against slavery and slave trade. They were notably more relaxed when it came to transatlantic um, slave trade. And I think that was not only because of um, racist reasons, even though of course it was, but because this was a particular form of slave trade that was actually absolutely fundamental to the development, um, or especially of transatlantic capitalism. And I think this oscillation and collapse has also another dimension. And the, this is the dimension that I discuss in the form of who decides. Because even if you buy the promise of the logic of improvement, it has imminent need the logic of biology because the idea of the logic of improvement is that it is up to Western international lawyers to judge which communities are civilized or not and to set conditions or conditionalities um, based on which they might or might not be considered civilized. So there is an inherent um, idea of inferiority and superiority, even if in what looks to be a relatively or theoretically egalitarian logic of improvement. F the next point I want to discuss with you is, okay, sure, that might be true, but why does it matter, especially if you don't care much about the standard of civilization as such? Is this important for international law and international legal theory more broadly? And I think it is. And my personal anecdote, the way I have come to think about it by way of my personal anecdote is that basically when I moved to Melbourne um, in 2016, I reread From Apology to Utopia by Mats Koskiniemi. And I had a problem and the problem was I could not find something to disagree with. I, I thought the argument is essentially solid. And I think that raises a question as somebody who understood herself to be working within the Marxist tradition, which is how can I think that the argument of structural legal indeterminacy is right and keep being a Marxist? Of course, one answer is that you can't, like you have to stop being a Marxist. And in a sense, reactions to arguments about structural legal indeterminacy indicate so, because the standard Marxist and left legal um, reaction to arguments about legal indeterminacy is that this is a bad way of thinking about law because it makes it impossible to critique laws and let's say international laws in this case complicity with exploitation and domination if law doesn't have a definite 
content, how can we say that it does bad things in the world? And that's definitely the objection that has been raised both by Chimney and um, recently by Rose Parfit in her own fantastic book. My intuition has been that the problem with structured indeterminacy is not indeterminacy as, star, as such, but the conclusions that have been drawn from it. And the conclusions that were drawn, especially in Koskinyemi's next work, uh, The Gentle Civilizer. And to cut a long story short, this conclusion was one of a turn to the charismatic authority of the individual international lawyer who supposedly you know, would struggle through this legal indeterminacy with responsibility and self-reflexivity to find a solution that is more just or at the very least less oppressive. So my understanding is that there's something off there, but there's also something off with the fact that in Koskenyemi's work, the argument about structural legal indeterminacy seems to be hermetically sealed from the argument about the biases of international law. By way of reminder, because King Yemi's argument basically is that the bias of international law basically plays out in the institutions. So, you know, the famous quote that says, once you know which institution is going to decide something, you pretty much know how the matter will be disposed of. The IMF and the Human Rights Council tend to think about things in different ways. My own argument in this book is what if we thought about laws structured in determinacy as the specific way in which it manifests it, its bias? Let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean by that is my argument that what this oscillation that I have described does is that it reflects, it incorporates, and at the same time, it has successfully tries to resolve a very basic characteristic of global capitalism. Taking a step back, just to explain what I mean, capitalism, by capitalism at the very basic level, I mean generalized production for exchange and profit. And in the Marxian tradition at a very basic level, it is understood that capitalism tends to do two things at the same time. And it is in this tension, in this contradiction, that I think much of interesting third world this Marxism exists. First, it tends to expand in a never ending way to overcome all limits and borders. And in so doing, it homogenizes space, law, culture, life worlds, and so on and so forth. Basically, the logic of improvement. If you all become capitalist states with private law, bureaucracy, and control over territory, so if all political communities become capitalist states, then they will get rights. At the same time, though, Marxists have argued, this expansion happens in uneven ways. So at the same time as capitalism brings the world together and homogenizes it, also it creates fragmentation, divergence, and stratification. So for example, it was through the incorporation um, in global capitalism, the argument has gone that Latin America or Africa became underdeveloped because um, their societies and um, economies became subjugated to the needs of the capitalist core. So, and at the, so just as capitalism you know, transferred private law, it also made um, Sub-Saharan Africa extremely different from Sweden. So it created both homogenizing and extreme uh, difference. And of course, this difference um, is hierarchical and exploitative. So my argument is that at the end of the day, this constant oscillation between improvement and biology expresses this basic reality about capitalism and it tries to resolve it but unsuccessfully so. Um, 
because at the end of the day, and that's like a very core, obviously, materialist position, um, international law as a discursive system cannot definitely resolve the material contradictions of capitalism. So this is more or less um, the, the bare bones of the argument. And just to give you a sense of the way the argument is developed for those who might uh, not have had the chance to read through the book. I have an introductory chapter that I deal with quite a few methodological issues, um, including um, what it means to try to think about Marxism and deconstruction together, because this is not the most common pair you can find in the world. Then, um, I proceed to discuss 19th century, the 19th century, and especially I try to understand the standard of civilization in the 19th century through the practice of unequal treaties that I mentioned before, before between Western and so-called semi-civilized states. Um, chapter three um, deals with the League of Nations and specifically with the emancipation of Iraq from the mandate system. So basically what happened there is Iraq became the only state that was emancipated from the mandate system while the League um, was still in place. And in the course of discussing whether Iraq was ready to be emancipated, the Permanent Mandates Commission both repeated but also renewed for the interwar period the standard of civilization. Chapter four concerns the Southwest Africa saga in front of the ICJ. Um, and I'm especially interested in drawing out the fact that even in terms of virtual uses of the word civilization, civilizing mission civilized, the Southwest Africa saga pushes back against the idea that in 1945, everybody realized that this was racist crap and they stopped using the word civilization. Actually, the, civil, the Southwest Africa saga was all about what the civilizing mission of Article 22 of um, the Covenant League of Nations was. So in a sense, I'm also trying to recover that moment and I'm trying to recover it also as a moment of a huge defeat both for the anti-racist and third world this project, but as political projects, but also as juridical projects. Basically, they fought the law and the law won because they did try to use these oscillations against the grain, but it didn't go very well, as I'm sure you know. And finally, the final substantive chapter um, of the book deals um, with the modern iterations of the standard civilization, especially looking um, at the war on terror. And I'm looking at two distinct instances of the war on terror, the occupation, the occupation and neoliberal reform of Iraq um, after the 2003 invasion. And I'm also looking at the so-called unwilling or unable doctrine in contemporary um, use at Bellum. Um, and one of the things I'm hoping people to take away, especially from this chapter, is the fact that this sort of materialist analysis need not or should not uh, be only deployed when it comes to uh, fields of international law that, is, that are explicitly economic, but that they can also help us understand um, fields of international law like use at bellum or use in bello that are generally considered political or unrelated um, to political economy. And I think on that note, I'm going to, to conclude and I'm happy to actually um, respond to your questions. I think I'll stop sharing. Yes, Great. I think I did stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, you stopped sharing. Thanks so much, Dina. That was a, a really great overview of your book. And I, yeah, I can, can't wait to kind of hear some more about the questions and what people um, have been asking. And we've had quite a few come in already. So it's uh, going to be a difficult um, task to manage them all. But I'm going to start off um, with a question that we've had come in from um, Carla Firstman, who works at Essex with uh, Dr. Wong and I. Um, and Carla says, Thank you, Dr. Zivala, for your interesting talk. Your book looks fab. So there we go. Um, I look forward to reading it. So the question is, does a possible decline in the civilizing aspect of international law help us to debunk the Westphalian focus and the kind of monopoly of states and sovereign power and privilege? 
So under your framing, do you see more of a space for the role of non-state actors, NGOs, social movements, even individuals in claiming space on the international plane? And I also wanted to kind of slightly add to that question, thinking a bit about the role of civil society and NGOs, and ask you to think a little bit more or to speak a little bit more about the kind of wider role that they play. You know, do they maybe challenge this civilizing discourse or which to what extent do they also perpetuate it as well? Is kind of what I wanted to add there. So yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, too. So I mean, one of the things that I'm trying to say is that there hasn't been such a decline uh, in the in international law, right? That it, it has definitely changed form. And that's important if you're a lawyer, the change of form is a very important thing. But I'm saying that basically it hasn't, it hasn't declined. It, it exists as an argumentative pattern, maybe not as much as it did in the 19th century, but definitely much more than we suspect. So the second thing about non-state actors is that I feel one of the things um, my argument tries to illustrate, even though I didn't do so directly, but is in a sense the impulse of thinking about state and private actors as entirely separate, right? Because the whole idea here is that the state has to become a state that looks in a particular way so as to enable capitalist accumulation, right? Uh, so it's not it's not like state, it's not a statist argument the way Schmidt or I don't know, whoever, like a Gambian statist, because it is the state is basically in this context, the encapsulation of social relations is nothing more and nothing less than that. So that's already quite, but of course that's a theoretical argument, whereas I feel Carla's argument is much more about literally like can private actors intervene or non-state actors um, intervene in international law. And I, I think again, my argument about the practical aspect of it is that if the theoretical argument is correct, like, Statism in international law is a form that cons conceals a reality in which private actors actually play an extremely important role. Your, your question about um, individuals or social movements or whoever challenging it, I think the, the closest I got to looking into that is the chapter about the Southwest Africa um, case. And I think it's, a, I, partially open with a pretty provocative um, passage by SWAPO. SWAPO was the self-determination movement, the national liberation movement in Namibia that says we don't care about international law. And they say, you know, they, they, they have this argument, that they have this passage that says, if anything, the judicial battles of the last 20 years have done more to conceal um, than to um, than to reveal what's going on in Namibia. So, like that's the closest um, I get to that. I think the thing I would say about actors is, I mean, it's also such a difficult decision to have about all private actors and no social movements. It is not true that I think the standard of civilization has been extremely attractive. Um, to everyone, to state actors, to non-state actors, to individual lawyers, it has been extremely attractive because it carries this promise of equal inclusion, right? And like international lawyers and especially semi-peripheral international lawyers, like who are not necessarily working for the state, we're very eager, we're some of the most eager um, factions of society to show that their states were civilized, right? So I think if there's something to say about non-state actors would be how through time this has been an extremely alluring, but also depending on who you are, extremely dangerous way of arguing in international law. Great, thank you very much. Um, I kind of have a question which I think follows on quite nicely from that one in some way. So it's um, from Luisa Pereira. Um, so again, amazing lecture and waiting to receive the book which is, she's brought online. So that's uh, nice. Um, so says, oh, I lost the question quickly. Let me it's about Mestizo International Law. Exactly, yep. 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, show you mentioned it in the book, but what about the weaponization of international law by the uncivilized at different points and at different degrees of success? So, um, yeah, exactly as you said, about the Steezo and international law argument, um, which has been made as well. So, yeah, over to you yeah. for that one. Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question, Louisa. Thank you. So, my argument in the book is the following. Semi-peripherals, peripheral international lawyers and even peripheral international lawyers have been very good at challenging uh, especially the logic of biology when it was directed at them, right? And they were mostly challenging, juridically speaking, through challenging the question who decides. The argument is we decide if we have reformed enough. So when China says, I'm going to unilaterally um, terminate my treaty with Belgium about extraterritoriality because I consider that now um, I have become civilized enough. This is an assertion against the logic of biology. And it's an assertion that says, we can decide as much as you do. What is inherent though in saying that is accepting the logic of improvement. And of course, I think that's where the class analysis comes in, which is international lawyers and peripheral states were very happy to become peripheral states and they were very happy to commit genocide against indigenous peoples, right? If you read Calvo, uh, he's worse than any European international lawyer when it comes to indigenous people. And that I think is what is lost and it's not lost as an omission, it's lost as constitutive element in Mestizo international law, which is a celebration of these people or bordering on high geography. And I think is not necessarily attentive to the fact that the projects of capitalist accumulation and state building these people were involved and very invested both intellectually, but also as a bare matter of class interest, were not, they, they were squarely within um, the logic of improvement and even the logic of biology these semi-peripheral lawyers didn't want it for themselves, but they were very happy to direct it against others. Japan says in, at the turn of the 20th century, we are civilized now. And part of what it means to be civilized is to set up a racialized empire in Korea and China. So even the logic of um, biology is challenged in very particular ways in the 19th century. The 20th century, I would say, is a different business, um, and that's not what Mestizo deals with. But in a sense, my appraisal of the 20th century was that the folks in, implicated in the Southwest Africa saga tried to use this thing truly against the grain, but they got tangled in it. Uh, but I think it's also worth like thinking of the 19th century locationally third world this project and the 20th century politically third world this project in very different terms so that's that's basically my my argument okay, yeah there's loads there as well that could be a whole nother conversation in so many ways i think um but we have so many questions coming in so we have another one that i wanted to ask you that comes in from nicolo lanzoni um who again thanks you for your brilliant presentation and asks um Kind of two things in a way so the first is what do you think about the real reorientated interpretation of article 38.1 um, according to which civilized countries are now interpreted these days as those that conform to specific legal sp standards so respect of human rights equality and the rule of law and then kind of a follow-up to that do you think that international law can be viewed as an instrument of cultural hegemony in a Gramscian sense to convey and impose worldwide typical Western liberal set of values among which um, the Nicola would, Nicola would also add a free market society. So two right. quite big questions, but yeah. Yeah, they are. But let me, I'll start from the second one and see how it goes. One of the things I tried to do in this book is to decenter liberalism as the subject of critique in international law, which is, I think, for a number of reasons. One reason is that I think when interna critical international lawyers say liberals, they mean a very wide, wide, wide range of people, some of whom are not liberal 
well in any sensible or many non-sensible senses. And secondly, because I think this is 2021, this is not 1997, like sure, liberalism, like as in, it's like kicking someone on the floor, liberalism is kind of in, in perhaps not terminal crisis, but in crisis. And the third thing is, most of the time in most of the countries, capitalism has not been liberal. I mean, I said that in another thing, but like liberalism is sometimes a bit of like an eccentricity for rich people. Like I'm from a country with 20% unemployment. Nobody's a liberal. Um, everyone is something else. So in a sense, I don't think about liberalism I, or I think about liberalism as little as I can um, because I think a lot has been said, much is good, but much is, I think, a symptom of the rise of critique in the 90s where you could talk about liberalism but not about capitalism. So in a sense, I think um, Japan, again, at the turn of the century, became a modern capitalist state. It did not become a liberal state in any sensible sense of the word, but still it was recognized um, as civilized, right? Um, so, so to to cut a long story short, I don't I don't necessarily disagree with the idea that international law might also be doing this, so embodying a liberal hegemony, but or when that existed, um, but I think it does something much more fundamental than that, and I think it's also worth being alert to that, given the rise of illiberal capitalisms and their juridical states, right? China has a vision of international law that is not a liberal vision, but I do think China is a capitalist state. Um, and I think if we keep talking about liberalism, we might miss that. And that seems to me like a big um, omission. Um, about Article 38. So I think, I mean, obviously, Article 38 doesn't do the same thing it used to do um, in the interwar period. At the same time, I could tell you that, you know, at the same time, the general principles of laws uh, recognized by civilized states don't include, you know, indigenous law, uh, religious law, whatever. So like at the same time, it remains, of course it has changed um, content, but it remains within a very narrow um, frame. And also the other thing is, I don't think the main locus of civilization and international law now is Article 38, because if I'm right that it's an argumentative pattern, it doesn't matter that the main place that it exists is there, because my argument is it's everywhere. Like I, I use Article 38 by way of illustration of the anxiety international lawyers experience when they see the word written down, rather than as necessarily meaning that this is the object of my inquiry. Thank you, Nicolò. Great, thanks so much. And yeah, just, just to add to that, I think the fact that your book kind of focuses on capitalism as opposed to liberalism is actually really, really important. It's a big turn in kind of the scholarship, which probably needs to catch up with the contemporary, like you said. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, in the kind of um, tradition of this lecture series, we have some formalist questions that I want to ask you, uh, because as you know, Dr. Wigan, I are keen to bring critical and more formalist perspectives together. So we have a couple of questions come in from Martins Paparizgis, um, who asks um, two f smaller formalist questions about your chapter on Southwest Africa. Um, so the, the first is your claim is that the distinction, I think, that the distinction the court draws in the second phase of the case between conduct obligations and special interest rights, for which only the latter can be challenged in the court, is an arbitrary one. Another way of reading the point is that the distinction is analytically sound, distinguishing between primary rules, responsibility for the breach of which can be invoked by injured states and non-injured states. And the same point comes up, um, points out in the Barcelona Traction case on Erga Omnes, so investment protect protection versus Erga Omnes and Article 42 and 48 of the ILC articles. 
Um, so most people would now say that states can invoke responsibility for breach of obligations in both categories, but would still draw on the same analytical distinction. So in short, the, the for, is the formalist question is right, even if the answer is not, is kind of what he's asking you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, I mean, obviously, as Martin's known, knows, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the business of saying if the answer is right or wrong. Like, I don't care. Um, and partially, that's what I'm trying to say, right? That everyone was mad at the court in 1966 and everyone is like, the court was wrong. What I'm trying to say is, I think the court was outrageous and I will return to that, but I don't know if it was right or wrong. Because my argument is that the court and, and the applicants and the respondents were working with a discursive system that could, that was lending itself to the bizarre conclusion they reached. The other, the, the specific, but the answer to the, to the formalist answer also of the question is the following. The court in 1966 tries to say, the majority of the court, tries to say we are just some nice formalist black letter people and we just don't want these political things to get into this thing. The problem is that if you read Article 7 of the mandate, Article 7 says states can bring uh, claims in front of the Permanent Court of International Justice for breaches of the mandate. It doesn't say the injured state, it doesn't say it can bring claims for some breaches of the covenant, but not for uh, not of the mandate, but not for others. It uses a very broad language that you don't necessarily have to understand as obligation uh, governance in the sense of Barcelona attraction, but you can understand it as a treaty based system that gives everyone standing um, to enforce the obligations of this treaty. This is important for me for a non-formalist reason. And my non-formalist reason is the majority of the court in 1966 decides which universalism can ground standing. And it says Christian universalism of sending missionaries in the mandates absolutely can ground standing. Pan-Africanist universalism, and especially if it might go a bit communist, it absolutely cannot ground standing. That's what I'm trying to say. So in a sense, I'm not trying to say that the court was wrong. I'm trying to say first that the court was not formalist. It might have been right or wrong in your register. It certainly was not formalist. And my second thing was, it was not formalist in a very interesting way, if you're critical, but because I, th I think it was not formalist in a way that privileges a particular type of universalism over another type of universalism. And that's the thing I'm interested in. Um, the, Mart Martis has a second bit, but I think I might respond to that later. Yeah, I think we'll get maybe um, move on to ask some other questions from other people because I want to give as many people a chance as possible. But it's another very good question, so maybe you can go bilateral on that one. Um, but yeah, so I have another question from um, Caldwell Kassler, who again, another of my colleagues at Essex, um, starts off with a quote from Marx, which is always nice. Um, so between <laughs> equal rights, force decides. Uh, Mark says. So would you say that the structural indeterminacy of international law, so fragmentation, anarchy, etc., creates the conditions for a transnational capitalist, cl capitalist class to succeed? And if so, does that recognition reconcile Koskinemi with Marx? So theoretical question there. Right, that's an interesting question. So, so between equal rights, force decides is, I mean, just for everyone to be on top, is a quote from Marx, but it's also a quote that is very central to China Mievo's and other uh, Pashukanian accounts of international law. So he, in a sense, my, um, excuse me, um, can I see the question? Because I, sorry guys, it's getting, it's past 10.30 here, so. Um, <laughs> Can you read me the second half of the question? If I think that fragmentation is enabling. Uh, so would you say that the structural indeterminacy of international law creates the conditions for a right. transnational capitalist class to succeed? Yeah. Right, 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 right. I think as I was, I think my argument is slightly different. 
My argument is the structural indeterminacy of international law is reflective of a reality of capitalism that nobody is in control of. Capitalists are not in control of it. States are not in control of it. Proletarians are not in control of it. Of course, different actors are not in control of it in different ways. But in a sense, my argument is not one about um, in the instrumentality of law, is about law as reflective of different structures, but also in a sense of laws powerless. Because my argument is law at the end of the day as law cannot resolve this. Like this cannot be resolved through legal means. So my argument is less of a class argument about international law and more of a mode of production argument of international law. Of course, within which, obviously, if you're more powerful, the chances of your argument succeeding definitely tend to be better if you're weaker. But I also feel that like formalism has been an instrument of power as much as indeterminacy has been an instrument of power and formalism has been an instrument of resistance as much as indeterminacy has been an instrument of resistance. That's not a thing I care about as a theory. That's a thing we might care a lot as praxis, right? And knowing which moment is right to deploy which tool. But I don't think this is a the in particularly interesting theoretical question, at least not to me. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dina. We have so many questions kind of coming in around your theoretical framework, actually. So um, I was thinking I might ask um, something a bit further about this. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, to kind of think a bit more about race and racial capitalism here. So we have a question from Amaka Vani, um, which thanks you again for your presentation. Um, so slowly working through your book and thinking about the question on race and capitalism. So the question is specifically how race or racial capitalism is made possible through, uh, the question disappeared, um, made possible through certain international agreements to operate in an exploitative, operate exploitatively, or is the question of race limited to colonizing activities? So that's the question. Awesome, thank you, Amaka. Um, so basically, I need to differentiate two things about the scope of the book. I think we can think of race in two registers. And of course, they, they are together, but I think let's, let's do them as two. We can think of race as a trope in, and as an argumentative trope in international law. And we can think of race as a material relationship of exploitation and domination, right? I am mostly doing the former, so I'm treating race as a trope international lawyers have determined, and in a sense I'm saying the trope is still here, it's everywhere. If you read um, unwilling or the literature on the unwilling or unable, basically they're, like, the argument is that like arguments made by African states or by post-colonial states in general don't count much because they are emotional or whatever. Um, so in a sense, it obviously goes far beyond um, colonization, it, as in formal colonization and it steeps modern um, international legal argumentation, right? Um, I do not deal yet with the question of race and racial capitalism as a real thing that exists in the world. That is what I want to actually do after. So maybe Amaka and I should have a conversation in, in a few months or a few years. Um, but because I also know that Amaka works in like uh, patents and international trade and investment law, I think it would be really interesting to th think about the ways in which these fields have been thought of as, you know, racially neutral, but of course they distribute wealth and death and accumulation in profoundly racially um, unequal ways. But in a sense, that's a thing I don't necessarily deal with in the book in the same way I don't deal with gender 
as a material relationship of dispossession and exploitation, I deal with uh, gender as a trope. Um, and I, I do try to distinguish it because I think it's such an important thing that it deserves like serious treatment in its own right. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I also really enjoyed um, the stuff around gender in your book. And I think um, a lot of kind of critical international lawyers could learn from you in your focus on that. So um, I think it's something you did very well. Um, so I'm aware that we're kind of getting towards the end of time. So we probably have time for a couple more questions. So I wanted to ask one by from Ainsley Go. Um, which says, um, is reading your book right now, and he uh, says in chapter five, um, you apply your kind of theoretical framework to the unwilling and unable um, doctrine as it applies to the use of force. Um, how would you apply, uh, apply the unwilling and unable concept in the field of international criminal justice? So thinking specifically about kind of complementarity. Um, so difficult question, yeah. I imagine, but yeah. I know, so yeah, I have to say my knowledge about international criminal law is I know it exists and I know it's a bit dodgy, uh, but that's all I know about it. And so the answer is I don't know. And part of the reason the answer is I don't know, apart from the fact that it is evidently true, is that methodologically, I'm trying to be very serious about text and textuality. And the answer is if I haven't read these texts, I can't quite tell you, um, how it works, if at all, because part of my argument is the standard of civilization is one argument amongst many, and there might be other arguments, and they might be bad in their own uniquely horrible ways, or maybe some of them are not bad, maybe some of them are okay. Um, so in a sense, what I try to do, especially with the introduction, is if anyone wants to take up the invitation, to give people a methodological tool to use this insight um, to understand better their own fields. So like in a sense, I would turn back the question and be like, I would actually love to hear that. And I would love to hear if it does work um, in that aspect of unwilling or unable, um, because I don't know. Great. Um, thanks, Dina. Yeah, always good to kind of recognise our own limitations as well. I did think that one might be a bit of a challenge, but I thought I'd see it. So I was interested to see what you'd uh, have to say. Um, so probably our last question um, for today, um, I wanted to ask you, it's more about kind of, yeah, your method and your um, framing and your toolkit, because I think for me, that's something that's really, really innovative about this book. So I kind of wanted to end on this one. Um, so it comes in from Rahini Sen. Um, which, the, so the question pertains particularly to the toolkit that you're using to create your analysis. So the question is, did you choose Marxism and deconstruction in anticipation that this combination would best explain how to tap into this indeterminacy and locate it um, in a kind of more determinate manner on the critical spectrum? So in other words, was there something about those two theories that made you gravitate towards them? Or did they, you, they kind of, um, the discovery of them help you tackle this critique? So kind of a question about which way round you found things out in a way. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, at this, you know, at a certain level, you can never answer this question. Like, why do I like Marxism and Derrida? I don't know, whatever. Something happened in my childhood. <laughs> at a very certain, at a very basic level. But what I think they do do, regardless of how I got there, is on the one hand, I think Marxism offers the best effort I think we have had collectively as humanity to understand um, the capitalism both as a totality but as a contradictory totality and I think that's often lost in Marxist accounts of international law including China Mievo. Um, I think that's also lost that the fact that there is there is more than one logics and they are contradictory and that's what I, I think that's very central in Marxism in Marx, actual Marxist critique of capitalism. So I think that's, that helps me understand the materiality of it. And at the same time, deconstruction helps, like, helps me deal with the fact that if things are indeed so contradictory in reality, it's quite unlikely that they end up in texts either very clear and unambiguous and, you know, 
um, straightforward um, ways. So in a sense, deconstruction helped me. And at the same time, I think also deconstruction helped me and push back against both a Marxist, but also critical um, impulse in international law that can be the mirror image of liberalism. Liberalism tells, tells law is omnipotent and good. And it's very easy to say, oh no, law is omnipotent and bad. And like politically that's interesting, theoretically it's not. Like theoretically that's not at all an interesting thing to say. So I think in a sense the construction helps me think of law at the same time as powerless like as a silly thing at a certain level. Like Marxism helps me think of it as a very dangerous thing, but the construction helps me think of it as powerless and silly and contradictory. Um, and to me, somehow this thing appeals. I don't, again, I don't know why. Why does it appeal? That's between me and my therapist, um, but somehow it does. Thanks, Dina. Um, I'm sure you have amazing conversations with your therapist about all of this. <laughs> um, wish we could Don't all see. <laughs> but um, I'm afraid that we are out of time and it is very late for you, so you must be exhausted. But I just wanted to thank you very much for that interesting um, presentation and thank you to all the great questions. We didn't get through all of them. I tried my best to kind of do a variety, but very, very difficult. And I'm sure Dina is happy for you to email her if you want to go um, bilateral. Um, that also to note that you can get a discount on buying the book with um, the discount code. It's CAC, so Capitalism and Civilization 2020. Um, and I've checked it and it works. So um, do go to the website and do that as well um, if you're interested in buying the book. Um, but other than that, if you want to come in and, and say any final words? Um, just to say thank you for that very exciting and um, interesting lecture and for everyone for participating and tuning in. And I will see you next week when we have uh, Lucia Solano for her lecture. So thank you, everyone. All right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, if anyone wants to send me any of the questions, I'll, I'm happy to have a go. Thanks, Dina. Yeah, some of them are quite hard too, so <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Sleep well. <laughs> Bye. Have a good day. Bye.